Good evening, uh, fellow gardeners. I'd like to introduce Pat Van Akron Adricum. He spent his childhood growing up in the Butchart Gardens where his father was a gardener. He has lived in Deep Cove in North Saanich with his wife Kathy for over 40 years and has been growing orchids for over 45 years. At Kingfisher or Orchids, which is his uh, email address, Pat and Kathy specialize in warm growing orchids, primarily Phalaenopsis. Pat has been breeding and cloning his own orchids for many years and has many crosses registered with the Royal Horticultural Society in England. Over this time, Kingfisher Orchids has won over 50 American Orchid Society awards for flower quality, culture and display. Currently, they are breeding to create new hybrids in red, yellow, and art shades, as well as cloning selected species and desirable hybrids. When not playing with his orchids, Pat owns a local business called Service First Limited and can often be seen out fishing for salmon or halibut. Please help me welcome Pat. So I've been, um, I grow in North Saanich um, off of Wayne, in between Wayne and um, Downey on Derrick on Cromar. And uh, we've got a small greenhouse there that um, has been expanded and expanded. And um, that's where we kind of do all, most of our breeding and cloning in the basement and a bit of um, uh, toothpick work out in the greenhouse. So this is the greenhouse. Um, this is this used to be the uh, cool section over here, and this used to be the intermediate section. This used to be the warm. From about here to here, started out as a um, a small little solarium where we had wicker furniture and some nice uh, little ponds and things in there. But I took that all over, rotted the furniture, threw the bricks out put in benches, pots, you know, the rest. And now this is all warm. This is a little warmer down this end. I keep this at about 20 degrees constantly, day and night. And that's for my little seedlings. They grow on these little trays that are underneath here. Um, this is my best growing area right here. So that's where I keep all my stud plants and plants that I'm trying to um, move on into display plants. Um, this is the type of Phalaenopsis that we grow. We don't grow the, the big, um, what we call supermarket or box store type of plants. Um, the reason is, is that these are just as long lasting. They don't take up as much space um, and it's different. And the other beautiful thing is that they're fragrant. 99% of these are very fragrant. This is how we um, name these plants. So it's a fowl, Phalaenopsis. This is uh, a name that's registered in, in, at the RHS in England, Hawaii Dragon Girl. And then this particular clone is DT, or Dragon Tree. And this has got an award of merit from the American Orchid Society. So um, most of these orchids that you'll see and buy in, in the big box stores and supermarkets, they're growing in sphagnum moss. And we, we grew in sphagnum moss for years. Um, originally it came from New Zealand, which is a really excellent product. But um, about 20 years ago, the moss uh, became available from Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, some from mainland China. And uh, the growers in Taiwan used this exclusively for growing Phalaenopsis. Problem is, is that the New Zealand moss is very expensive and hard to get and um, you know it was just we just were kind of forced to go into the moss from Chile or Argentina so what we did is um, we, we buy it in uh, five cubic foot bales and the the moss was getting poorer and poorer and poorer and it was almost into sort of being rotten by the time we got it. So there was a huge demand for moss and the, uh, the workers weren't getting anything for it so they rebelled and then there was this big moss shortage. So it was kind of one of those things that we, we kind of had to um, very quickly uh, try and find something else. Um, 
most of the big big growers they sterilize their moss because it has this white mold which grows in it after it gets wet. Um, I think it's because that they just don't leave it out in the sunshine long enough to sterilize it when they pre-pack it down there. It's packed a little bit wet and there's some spores in there and initially it doesn't seem to bother the roots too much but you'll see that you know it'll lay on the root and it'll kind of smother the root because orchid roots are uh, fairly unique in that they have an outside coating of velamen and an inside core and this outside velamen is what holds the water and if if this outside rots off it could rot off in a half inch section but the rest of the root can still be good as long as that center cord is okay um, the other problem that we're having with the moss is that the pH was way out of whack um, three to three and a half you guys are gardeners you know that that's not right and we needed to get that up to you know at least five if we can um, so we we do monitor our our root zone um, we go through the greenhouse and we take little uh, water samples and test it um, just to see what's going on um, usually I can tell when it's time to repot because I can't I can't get that it just continues to go down and down and I can't bring it back up so that's how I kind of and I it, you pretty much before that time you can see it in the plants um, so what what were the what were the options well there's lots of options you can grow orchids in just about anything I've seen them growing in pebbles in uh, wine corks um, stones you name it they'll grow in anything if you watered them correctly but we sort of uh, years ago started using um, a pro mix called BX and um, that was a um, a product that was very popular for you know potted plants mums and things like that and we had a lot of problem with it because it just held water too long and so um, I got a hold of this guy, found this guy on the web, Dr. Shiv Reddy, and he was very helpful in helping me to sort of come up with some options instead of the moss. And what he recommended was, um, B, it was HP instead of the BX. HP stands for high porosity. And that's a very popular one right now. That's a lot of what they use in potted mums and things like that. So he suggested um, a couple of things for me to try. So. Uh, 2015 I started doing this and and basically what uh, he recommended was to add a little bit of extra perlite and a little bit of crushed dolomite lime and um, a lot of scientific papers had said that phalaenopsis plants cause the root zone to go acidic and we kind of looked into that and I think that what they were seeing is that they weren't making it acidic. What they were doing was um, allowing it to become acidic because they were taking up so much of the um, of the calcium that is in that potting mix. Because they grow a fairly big plant in a small pot, and I think they absorb all of that calcium because they need that for the cell growth. So we started a couple of trays um, in this mix. So it's just a, a standard uh, pro mix HP. Um, they come with mycorrhiza in it now. Uh, I think that helps to kind of fend off some of the um, root rots and um, perlite. And the perlite that we use is the big popcorn size. I can show you um, what that looks like a little later on. It's the large. I think it's one of the largest sizes that there is. So this is kind of what we've seen after a couple of months, uh, and it's what we want to see. We want to see these big fat white roots in there. Um, happy plants. The leaves were like half again as big really quickly. So um, like we had never, this is sort of a, a trial because there's not very many people growing in, in HP and some of the growers that do grow in it are kind of secretive about what they do. So this was kind of a trial just out of the blue for me. I had no guidance as to how to pot or, or how to water or anything. Um, so this is basically the, the size of the trial and I tried a, a lot of these are you know some of them got different species like Gigantea in the background and some of the long thin leafed ones uh, could have Amboinensis in the background. This one has Gigantea for sure by the coloring on the leaves. So there's a mix of genera in there but they're all Phalaenopsis. So keep an eye on this leaf as we go through. So this is um, May, this is 
June, same leaf. July, already got a second leaf coming. September, they're really filling in there. I'm having trouble getting water down into the bottom of them. And then so I potted up some. And so this, this is a section here that I potted in a little bit bigger pots. And I kind of put them into um, one of my prime growing areas in the greenhouse because I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but I'm, I was pretty much liking the way they were growing. Nice big fat leaves and the flowers were about half again as big and I could fertilize a little more heavily than I could before. The uh, bottom leaves weren't dropping off, which meant that the older roots were still alive and supporting those older leaves. And that was July in 2017. And at that point, I had to start thinning them out because they were shading each other. This is on a vertical rack. They grow just kind of as you see them there. The rack's leaning back at maybe about 15 degrees, but they do grow on a vertical rack from floor to ceiling, which is about 10 or 12 feet. I have to get on a ladder to water the top ones. And this is January 2018. And you can see that there's, you know, I'm getting good bunches of flowers. Normally these only have like one or two flowers on a flower stem, but because I've been able to grow them well, put lots of leaves on and punch the fertilizer to them, they've been able to produce more and more um, flowers per flower spike and double spikes. Because a phalaenopsis will put out a spike for every leaf that it grows. So the faster you can get the leaves to grow, you can do the math. So this is kind of how I grow them. Um, I grow them in pots, but they're on trays, and there's a, a like an aluminum gutter underneath here that kind of clips in between the, the three rows where the pots are, and that's what holds them on the angle, and that's about the angle that they sit on. Because these plants normally are epiphytes, they grow on trees, so they don't like to be in a pot upright on a table, they prefer to be kind of hanging off of a tree. So, um, just going into, uh, we make our own hybrids and we take uh, two plants and cross them together and um, the orchids are very unique in that every single hybrid that has ever been made is registered at the RHS in England. So all the growers in Taiwan, all the growers in Holland, everywhere around the world all register their crosses at the RHS. and. Um, Basically what you do is once you've made the cross and say you've got a name on it, you put down what the two parents were when you made the cross, when it first flowered, because that's an important thing because you've got to beat the, the other guy. Whoever flowers at first wins. <laughs> and uh, you give a very brief description. And um, sorry, this one up here, this is the two choices. You have to give two choices of what you want to call it. These are the parents here. So there's this seed parent, there's the pollen parent and those two together. Usually, you know, they'll pick the, the first name that you, you offer up. I'm, I've been putting kingfishers in front of everything just so that it's a little bit of a marketing thing, but there's so many names like Bear King, there's, there's thousands and thousands of hybrids. So hundreds of thousands of hybrids. So basically to, f to find a name without three words in it is really tough. So I just put kingfisher in the front and that way people know where it comes from. And then you just uh, pays your money and then they uh, send you back a, a little registration form saying, yeah, way to go and here's all your hybrids. And from then on, no matter who makes that cross or whoever uses that cross to make another cross, those are the, those are the names they have to use. And it's kind of cool to, to see your hybrids, you know, some of the crosses uh, being used in Taiwan and places to make their own crosses that I've made before. And usually what I try to do is, um, just so I can keep it straight in my head, because I'm not very good memory, Kingfisher's Canary Dragon. So it's Young Ho Jelb Canary with Dragon. So I know that I've got Young Ho Jelb Canary and Dragon Tree Eagle in there. So that's part of how I, I name my plants. That and I, I uh, print them on waterproof paper and stick them in the greenhouse. Um, so there's a Kingfisher's Keelani King, that's one of the ones that uh, um, 
we'd show in there. That's a first bloom seedling from that cross. It's very exciting. It's like you guys when you're planting out some new seeds. There's always a sport in there or something like that. And, and it's really exciting to see the first blooms because you've got, um, I think as humans, we we see the best in both flowers, but there could be some really bad traits in the flowers, but we're always looking at the best in there. So you put two really best flowers together, but we forget about the bad traits that they had in behind them, like, you know, um, some of the curling in the f flowers, maybe a little bit of cupping up on the, up on the top here, some ribs in here. Um, small little things, but uh, it, you know, those are important things when you're um, breeding on and judging. We try to use the very, very best flowers that we can and plants and clones. And you can see in here, potted in um, the mix of uh, HP and this coarse perlite. The roots are just loving it in there. This is canary dragon, young ho jelb canary, dragon tree eagle. A lot of these came out the same, same again. And there's some very cool colors. These are these are pretty true. There, there's some really kind of indigo uh, colors coming out in some of these lips from Dragon Tree Eagle. Uh, giant Wood, uh, Gigantea, Soko Hollywood. Those are quite big flowers. They're about um, uh, almost six centimeters across. Big for this type of breeding. Um, these are a couple of uh, plants that we've uh, been using in our breeding program to get the art shades. This is what we call the art shades. This is um, uh, this is a cross on the right over here. This is um, Gigantea, which is the largest in the genus, the largest plant. That's why they named it Gigantea. It has can have each leaf can be over three feet long, and uh, can have up to 100 flowers on a flower spike. From seed, they take about 15 years to bloom. <laughs> is that a drawback? Yeah, my age it is. <laughs> and um, when I first started growing orchids, there was, uh, in the Phalaenopsis, there was nothing in this color range and very few in the yellows. Like a clear yellow, when I first started growing, we were selling for about $5,000. And, you know, you just hope that it would come down, which they have. I mean, um, you know, these plants are kind of at the at the, the bottom of, of the price range now, which is kind of good and bad, but it, it makes them available to everybody. This is um, bred with an indigo violacea. Um, this is LD's Bear Queen. And we're always on the internet searching, seeing what other growers are doing. Facebook, it seems to be the the one place that everybody has gone to to post their pictures and um, sort of share their their plants all over the world so we can see what other people are breeding and the Taiwan uh, breeders are way ahead of us because they've got a much shorter season or sorry a, a shorter season from seed to flower they can do it in about a year and a half um, we might get one or two plants that'll do that in a year and a half but they're majority of their plants do it at that just because of their warm climate and uh, the light that they have and they're good growers. So I seen this this cross and I was really impressed with it. I seen a few pictures of it and I happened to I had the parents and so I thought to myself that they made it the wrong way around. Um, they used uh, Dragon Tree Eagle as the a pollen parent and I thought it would be better if I used it as a pod parent so that's what I did and uh, the cross came, this cross came out way better than most of the original ones so this is a grouping of plants that we exhibited and it was judged by the American Orchid Society and it got an award of quality in AQ so you have to have at least uh, 12 plants we had 14 just in case and um, at least two of them have to be awarded and the rest have to be kind of of award quality so they don't they don't give them out easily but it was it was really nice to be able to do that with my own cross to keep enough plants back that I could do that um, this is another AQ that I got on one of my crosses this is uh, Kingfisher's Dragon Wing John Ewing cross with Dragon Tree Eagle 
and you can see how much variety there is in there. There's, um, you know, there's some reds, some really bright sunset colors all the way through to um, kind of yellows with a little bit of suffusion in them. This is more like the Dragon Tree Eagle. But here, the, all of these plants are growing in, in the HP mix, and you can see nothing wrong with the leaves. That's, that's the way we like them to look. Not super dark green, not yellow, but this light uh, green in between. That's the right amount of light. A um, couple of things that can happen. Uh, these are warm growing plants and uh, the odd time I'll have a, a power out and you know it doesn't feel like it's that cold in there but just enough cool air um, on the bottom down by the concrete can cause cell collapse and sometimes it, the cells completely collapse like this and sometimes it's just a little bit of marking on there and it shows up maybe um, two to three weeks later. doesn't happen really quickly. Um, and this can also be caused by watering with cool water when the plants are hot. So if you're on a really hot day and although you think the water feels kind of tepid warm, um, it can cause that same cold damage. So if you see that, um, it looks very close to sunburn. This is what sunburn will look like too. Um, sunburn usually happens sort of on these curved portions. It's kind of like our shoulders if we're outside, our shoulders get burnt first. Not because we're closer to the sun, but just that it's round and it's exposed uh, to the, the sun. This is kind of a cool thing. I'll, I'll briefly talk about this. This is, I have, a, um, I have a temperature probe and humidity probe in the greenhouse that wirelessly transmits this information to a PC or to a smartphone. So when I go on holidays and a guy is supposed to water on Tuesday, I can tell if he's watered because <laughs> my humidity should be going up on Tuesday. And I can send him that text saying, hey, water. So it's a very cool thing. Um, all, all this information is stored and it's very reasonable. You can use this to monitor any area. So you could have this in, a, in an outside greenhouse beaming back in. Um, to a gateway which goes into your router and um, it's fairly easy to set up. This is, um, uh, uh, I think they're about, they're under $100 for the, for the whole thing. So it's a pretty, pretty sweet thing. It's a very peace of mind for me. When I'm away, I check it every couple of days. It's called Lacrosse Mobile. So it's L-A-C-R-O-S-S-E Mobile. Quite a cool thing. The, um, you can see how you know, this is basically watering day here. It's got to be because the humidity is spiked way up. That's the only thing that'll cause the, the humidity spike. And then I usually rely on the sensor. So usually you can tell when the sun's out. This is, I don't know when this was, uh, I can't really read it, but this is definitely kind of winter time because uh, in the summertime, these, the spikes will be up around uh, 90, 95. In this past little sun that we've had this past week, it's gotten my greenhouse has gotten up to about 95. So that's a very quick um, blast at that, but I want to show you how to repot and the type of mix that I have because that's the uh, that's the most important thing um, to keeping your plants uh, happy. So phalaenopsis. How many people have a phalaenopsis that looks kind of like that? Yeah or like this one. These are two that were dropped off at my house. I, people know and they just drop them off at my house when I'm away on holidays. <laughs> so somebody will come and claim them. I don't know who's there, if it's nobody here. But uh, I thought, well, I, I got to repot them anyway, so I'll just bring them in and, and show you um, what I do and, and what should work for you as well. So uh, phalaenopsis are kind of unique in that they will produce what we call keikis or babies. Keiki is a Hawaiian word for baby and uh, there was a lot of growers in, um, in Hawaii at one time before the Taiwanese kind of took away their market. Um, and they coined these as, as keikis on the side of the flower stem. So every flower stem has an adventitious node going down it and on those adventitious nodes you can have either a flower stalk or a uh, little plantlet form. So what I'm going to do, and these plantlets have got roots on them already. 
So they just come off pretty easily like that. My wife says she wished giving birth was that easy. <laughs> um, well, if they're growing well, um, I would say they need repotting every year. Phalaenopsis love to be repotted. There's nothing wrong with uh, repotting a Phalaenopsis at any time, really. Even when they're flowering, Even when they're flowering yep. But, you know, usually if they're, um, if they're flowering, um, it's one of two things if they've been in the pot a long time. Either they're happy or they're not happy. And if they're not happy, they're blooming because they need to reproduce. If they're happy, um, they're going to put out a lot more flowers and they're going to do that every year. So these are just wire stakes that are in there. So this one looks like it's been potted in um, coir, which is um, coconut husk. And they've just wrapped it around a chunk of moss in the middle. Not the best thing to do, but a good way to get by at a sales table. Because if there, it's a big plant growing with a small pot, it tips over. So that's kind of what happens sometimes. So that's basically what we've got. Now there's a center core down here that the old roots will be on and the old roots will be rotten and you can take that center core, this one's actually not too bad, but you can take that center core if there's a bunch of dead roots right in the center and just grab it and it, it will break off at a natural point kind of like asparagus does. It'll just crack off and then you'll be left with a bunch of old roots and you can just discard that. Some of these uh, smaller older roots or so older leaves will just come off easily if they've got a, a root above the leaf. They're, you can just take those off. They're not really required. So I usually take them, a few of them off. The, this plant has gone a long time. That it, This is well overdue for repotting. Because if I was to repot this where it should be, up around where the roots are just coming out, all those leaves would be under the mix, which is uh, not a good place for them. So snips, uh, I usually flame these so you don't transmit viruses. Um, flame them. Every, uh, every plant that I do, I flame them. So that's about ready to repot. Usually I like a pot that's got a lot of drainage in the bottom. Lots of air holes and even some air holes up the sides will, will work out well. And you can, uh, in a pot that size with that root ball, I would put a few peanuts maybe in the bottom. That's the these foam packing peanuts that, uh, not the ones that are made out of um, corn. So if you lick them and they melt, don't use them. And if you've got a, say you've got twice that many roots, you, you could actually root trim them. You could cut the roots off like that and it wouldn't hurt the plant at all. Wouldn't set it back. But I think I can fit most of these in here rather than getting. And there's two types of roots. There's these aerial roots and there's the roots that were in the pot. And they look different, but they're the same creature. So these guys can go in the pot and they will actually not rot in there. They're just fine down in there. Looking better already. And if some of the roots crack, it doesn't really matter because, like I said, that outside velamen uh, keeps working and it'll just hold the moisture even if there's cracks in it, segments, it'll transmit it down to the core and it'll run back. This is the mix that I'm using right here. And it is four parts HP and two parts of the coarse perlite, which is what this is here and mixed with about half a part of water and uh, maybe a tablespoon of dolomite limestone crushed. And I mix it up by hand. It, it, it blends very easily. And I, you kind of, um, it's kind of like making cookies. You know how you got to crumble it and get it to that consistency, not too, um, 
it, it still has a little bit of texture to it. There's still a few little bumps in there. And then we can just start putting this in. Tapping it really helps, but you don't want to push it down with your fingers. And that's about all it needs to be done to that one. And that will grow very, very well, way better than being in this stuff. So do that with these guys too. There's those small little leaves, a couple of them there, they're ready to come off. And what happens with a phalaenopsis, every time it puts a leaf out, puts a new set of roots out. So um, these older leaves are sometimes uh, attached to sort of semi-rotten roots, and so they're never really going to do much good for the, for the plant anyway. This is a decent sized little plantlet, so I'm not going to bother crocking the bottom. Jam them down so that they're kind of at the, where the roots are coming out are, is kind of about half an inch below the lip of the pot. And I just um, put my finger on one of the roots to kind of hold it in place. I have about 3,000 plants in the greenhouse, 3,000 decent sized plants, which is a fair amount, but when you do the math, how many is that a day that I have to repot? It's like 10 a day. That's a good thing I can do quite a few bit on the weekend. Do that again. Any questions? Just all the plants? Well, I, I make the crosses and I make about six flasks. Orchid seeds grow in flasks, in sterile flasks. It takes about um, uh, 10 months for the seeds to mature in the seed pod. And if you look on that basket on this side right at the front, that's a seed pod that's sticking out there, that big green cucumber. So that'll take about 11 months to ripen. Uh, I take the seed, I sterilize the, the seed with hydrogen peroxide, put it in a flask where I have some agar and put it under lights and hopefully I've done a decent job and it's not contaminated and then we grow those little seedlings on so we have about maybe 25 to 40 plants in a flask and then we we grow we keep about uh, five flasks of each cross we grow those up and then we pick out the plants that we want to use for breeding and we sell the rest the ones that aren't very good, I just throw them out because um, it's not good advertising to sell crappy plants. Everybody thinks all my plants are really good, but they're not. I got a compost pile half the size of this room. <laughs> it's not all failing ups, it's mostly neighbors' leaves. What is um, well, I, um, I put a, a list out um, twice a year. Uh, usually spring and fall, and uh, it's kind of like a mail order almost, so people order them off the web, and I ship to the U.S. and Eastern Canada. I ship to Russia. I've got my own uh, CITES. Does everybody know what CITES is? C-I-T-E-S, Convention of International Trade on Endangered Species. Um, Canada regards this just like a lion or a tiger. So I need all the paperwork to be able to ship it. So we do that and I get them uh, agriculture inspection on the plants, then bundle them up. It takes me to do a shipment to the US, it takes me two full days of work to get the paperwork, uh, pack the plants. I gotta take them to Royal Oak, get them inspected, then um, wrap them up, take them to customs at the airport they stamp saying, yes, there's that many in the box. And I got to take them to the um, uh, post office and mail them. That's the only way I can get them into the US. If I'm going down to speak in the US, I can't even take them over myself. I have to um, ship them to myself, mail them to myself. But it works. Yes. So 
very important. Um, Phalaenopsis like to be evenly moist but not wet. Now that's a hard thing to, does that help? No, probably not. Um, so basically uh, what we need to do is to water them heavy when we water them, but then let them almost dry out in between waterings. So I water in my greenhouse, I'm putting a few peanuts in here because there's not that many roots on this plant, they've all rotted for a big plant, but it'll, it'll be fine. This, this plant could survive on about three inches of roots in a good, uh, good environment. That's the beauty of this, uh, this mix. It's an open mix and it dries out a lot faster than you think it, it will. You'd think a peat moss holding water for a long time. In the house, I bet this won't last a week. You'd have to water this at least every week. So, um, I, I found that they grow exactly the same. They, they, one won't grow faster than the other, but I like to put some clear pots in amongst my black pots because then I can actually look and see what's going on inside. Usually I'll end up with a, a layer of algae or something on inside a clear pot, which I won't do on a black pot. But the roots inside a clear pot will be slightly green, so that tells me that they're photosynthesizing. So they can photosynthesize with their roots. So, but I haven't found them growing any faster. Um, because I have so many plants, they're kind of shading their own pots and roots anyway. But I assume that there's still some light coming in there. Um, how am I doing for time? It's 25 past eight. Okay. Yes. What, what's your comment on the fancy ceramic pots with the holes? Ah, they're okay. I, I mean, <laughs> they'll still live in there for sure. You can, like I said before, you can pot them in anything. You can actually just have them not in a pot and just spray them twice a day and the roots will grow along and the plants will be happy. That's how they grow in nature. They kind of hang and with the roots and kind of fall off the tree upside down. They're just hanging there by their roots. They have a flower spike and they have a couple of kikis and then the kiki breaks off and falls down. That's kind of part of how they're reproducing vegetatively and um, sexually with, you know, pollen coming from on a bee or something from that guy and coming over here and pollinating this one. That's how they get a bit of diversity. The, so watering on, with this material. Now, this is a, quite a, an open mix. And if you were to put a lot of water in here right off the bat, perlite would float up and your uh, peat would sink and the perlite would float out and you'd end up with a real gumpy layer on the bottom that air would not go through and too light a mix on the top. So the way I water, is I just give a very quick whisk with the wand, just a watering wand and a hose. And once I've got a tray done up, I just whisk over it a couple times just to wet the mix. Not enough to float the mix, but just enough to wet it. And then it'll get kind of a crust on it if you let it dry. Then from then on, uh, when you water heavy uh, or a little heavier, it won't wash out so badly. But very important to repot Phalaenopsis they put phenols back out of their roots. That's how they get rid of a lot of their waste products. So they will contaminate the site that they're sitting in. They're a, they're a monopodial growing plant. So, you know, they're, they're growing up this way. The bottom roots are dying off. The bottom leaves are dying off and they're moving. So they're moving into a new location all the time. And that's why you have to repot them, get them back in. Pretend like it's a new location with really good, good food down there. Um, Phalaenopsis are fairly hungry plants. Um, if you give them enough light, you can feed them quite heavily. Um, I use uh, a water-soluble fertilizer um, with the first and last number the same, the middle number about half of that. So like a 10-5-10 a, a or a 20-10-20, uh, 20, anything like that that's a water-soluble. Um, I don't use urea. As a nitrogen source, I only use calcium nitrate because I want to give them as much calcium as I can. We don't have much calcium in our water here, so you need to be really aware of that. And that helps to uh, keep the pH um, up a little bit as well. Yes.
Right, and usually that's on the lower leaves. So what happens is that if it's not happy in its pot, the, the plant naturally will, um, uh, the bottom roots will go first, and those roots, remember I said that every new leaf gets a new flush of roots? Well, those roots that are the oldest and down into the worst part of the mix of the pot, they're gonna rot first, and they're the ones that have an attachment to that bottom leaf. So the bottom leaves will tend to go if you don't repot often. And you wanna keep all of the roots as healthy as possible in the pot. That way you'll keep as many leaves as possible. Once the leaves go leathery, it, it, it means usually once or two, three things. You haven't repotted enough, you've watered too much, or you're watering too little. So you have to kind of figure out which one of those it is. Now, by repotting, that solves one of them, and it's easier to keep an eye on on, the, on how much water you're giving it uh, when you're freshly repot, especially in this mix, because peat, um, it, if it's this dark brown color, it doesn't need to be watered. If it goes light brown, it needs to be watered. So that's a piece of cake. I can go around my greenhouse and look really quickly, just look at the clear pots and see which, which areas need water. I usually water once a week, I, I, um, I size my pots so that I water once a week because that's really all I can get in there. I will, I, I say I bless them, I just take the hose and give them one of those in the morning sometimes if it's going to be a really hot day. But um, for the most part, I, I heavy water once a week. And that's in a humid greenhouse, so in the house it might be even less than that. So you would discard that leathery? Yeah, you should try, I mean, I, I don't usually get that as much in a greenhouse because I've got more humidity. Um, it, it may be warmer and more buoyant kind of. I've got air movement in there and my roots may be in a better condition. So, you know, try the repotting first. Um, try to create as much humidity around them as you can. And that can be done with, you know, trays of pebbles. Bathrooms are a great place or by a kitchen sink. There, there's always humidity being created there. Um, those are two really good places to grow if you've got enough light in there. Um, the other thing is Phalaenopsis love to have um, a bright diffused light. So you can imagine like a south facing patio door with sheer curtains on it and a, a table about three feet away from that. So you can cast a very dull shadow but not a sharp shadow. That's kind of the type of light that they like. Uh, less than that, they'll, they'll be like these. These are, these are uh, I can tell this is grown in not enough light. They're too dark a green. I would like to see much, much lighter green. The other thing too is that in the house they get, they get a lot of dust on them. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to take them over to the, to the tap or in the uh, shower, uh, the vegetable sprayer thing, and just wash off the leaves every now and again. They'll, they'll love you for that. They, are, they will foliar feed, so you can use a, a very weak solution of foliar feed and spray it underneath the leaves. That's where they absorb the nutrients is under the leaves. Yes, yeah. Um, fish fertilizer, uh, kelp extract, like seaweeds, any of those things actually really do work. Um, I promised my wife I wouldn't use them anymore. <laughs> it smells like low tide in the greenhouse all the time. <laughs> but it, they, they do work. I have proven that it does work quite well. Yeah, the underside is where they, they have the, the ability to take up nutrients, oddly enough, yeah. Uh, Epsom salts is, is okay. It, it tends to green up the leaves quite a bit. Um, not absolutely necessary in the house. Um, just, a, you know, if you, uh, in the greenhouse I'm using about 200 parts per million of nitrogen when I'm watering. Um, in the house you could probably go 100, 150 and that would be enough. The other thing is how to, how to get them to bloom. There's a very easy way to get them to bloom. I can tell you how to do that in about a minute. Every time you get a new leaf, you should be able to get a flower spike. Flower spikes originate three leaves down. Count this as one, two, three. Your flower spike will come out there. How to get them to flower is you've got to be able to grow leaves. If you are growing leaves and you're not getting flowers, you've got to chill the plant down. So that means putting it sort of in a, in a cool room at night and then bringing it back into a, a warm environment in the daytime. So that's what triggers the spikes, is that big swing in temperature. 
That's it. That's as easy as that. Every time they put a leaf out, they should have the ability to put a spike out. And sometimes they'll put two leaves out, and if you keep them really warm, they won't bloom. So that's how you know you've seen the, in some of the big box stores how they've got like two big spikes, branching spikes, lots of flowers. Well, they grow them big. They grow them at 25 degrees C to 29 degrees C without cooling them down at all. So they get this all this vegetative growth, and then they put them over in the cool greenhouse, and then they can get two spikes because they, they can count down three, there hasn't been a spike, and they can count down four, and there's still no spike. So then they get spikes out of both of those places. Um, you can, about 18, as long as you go up to like 22 to 25 in the daytime, you know, get some, some sunny light on. And this time of year is a perfect time to, to do that. You can actually cool them down a little bit more than that if you... It, it can go down to about 16 on a big plant if you can warm them up to say 22 to 25 during the day. They need that warmth in the day to keep their engine running. But if you cool them down at night, that, that's enough to... Um, uh, it's like grapes, they increase their sugar if they, with the cold nights. That's why when you get to ice wine, you're getting down to the point where, where there's the most sugar in it. Same thing with, with Phalaenopsis or any of these orchids that you know, you cool them down and that's when they create enough uh, sugars in there that they can actually get a good blooming. Well, I think the questions could go on forever. You've they really, <laughs> really piqued our interest. It was just wonderful, Pat, to listen to your passion and your information about uh, your orchids. And I think your, your little... Uh, uh, just sideline kind of got away on you. <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anna, I only live about uh, 15 minutes away from here, so anybody uh, has any questions or anything, I'm usually around the greenhouse on the weekends. Give me a call, and you're, anybody's very welcome to come out and see what we're doing. Great, thanks.